for me, the most exciting thing you know, in the software area is the internet. And part of the reason for that is no one owns it. It's a free-for-all, and the rate of innovation is very high. We know from experience now that if any one company gets a dominant position in it, no matter who that is, the rate of innovation is going to drop precipitously. And we'd like to not see that happen forever, and, or at least for quite some time. Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. It's at least five years ahead of what's on any other phone. Good morning. Today, we're going to introduce iPhone 5. It is the most beautiful product we have ever made, bar none. iPhone 5 and iOS 6, the biggest things to happen to iPhone since iPhone. We've got some really cool stuff to show you. The iPhone 5 came at a pivotal point in the smartphone industry, a time when the market was beginning to, for the very first time, shift away from Apple and towards the very tempting offerings of key competitors like Samsung and HTC. While iPhones would always have their name recognition and brand value, the enticing larger displays and ever-creeping feature sets were difficult to ignore. Up to 2010, Apple had managed to lodge a firm hold in being the top dog of smartphones. They practically invented the category the themselves, and they had continued innovating year over year to ensure their prevailing dominance. The iPhone 4 in 2010 wasn't just miles ahead of anyone else, it was in a separate league of its own, with its class-leading retina display and unbelievably premium hardware capped off with Apple's own custom chipset, all making for the phone of the future, coming right at the turn of the decade. The iPhone 4 was so far ahead of even Apple's own previous iPhone that they ended up rushing a few things to get it out the door. The device suffered a fatal flaw in the antenna placements resulting in dropped calls, and the white color which was truly beautiful ended up being delayed about 10 months past its initial release, the June of 2010. And it wasn't until October 2011 we would see the next iPhone, well over a year later, the longest gap in iPhone launches ever, at which point Androids had begun to catch up and make a name for themselves with their larger displays. While the iPhone 4 still had the best screen with the most pixels per inch, it was still only a 3.5 inch screen, and so-called phablets like the Galaxy Note would end up being a huge commercial success, and ultimately one of Samsung's flagship products. The 4S, when it came out, was a solid upgrade to the iPhone 4, and it innovated a lot of areas under the hood, but that body was the same, and that's what people really cared about. And with yet another year before Apple's next entry into the line, Samsung and friends had plenty of time to outdo Apple at their own game, and finally forge Androids into genuine contenders in the smartphone market. Not to say that iPhone sales slowed down, because they didn't. So the early 2010s saw massive sale numbers across the board as the general public rapidly migrated over to the newfangled technology. For some, iPhones were getting stale, still small, with what seemed like the same old OS it had always had. It was Steve Jobs' mentality that a smartphone should be a size congruent with one-handed use, something that made a lot of sense early on. But as smartphones became more popular, what we used them for became more and more diverse in variety. They transformed from phones and web browsers to mobile game players, and then quickly into the ultimate hub for media consumption. And what's ideal when consuming media? A larger display. Single-handed usage be damned. Apple wasn't oblivious to the changing times, and they would account for this by adjusting their 2012 flagship screen to a 16 by 9 ratio, the standard widescreen aspect for the new age of high-definition video. But they weren't ready to desert the old one-thumb philosophy, and so they solely increased the height of the next iPhone, keeping the width the exact same, making it just as easy to use with one hand, a fair compromise between the two trains of thought. This would make the 2012 iPhone the first to ever increase the screen size, a move that would undoubtedly have a ripple effect on every new iPhone moving forward. And so the fall of 2012, over a decade ago now, Tim Cook took to the stage with the purpose of introducing the brand new iPhone 5, the biggest thing to happen to iPhone since iPhone. Hey, how's it going? I'm Josh from 91 Tech, and before we get too far into today's video, we do need to look at our sponsor, Narwhal. So, if Apple made a robot vacuum cleaner, this would be it. Narwhal is a company that created the first ever self-cleaning robot mop and vacuum, which would end up being the highest funded robot cleaner in Kickstarter history. And this is the updated model to that vacuum, the Narwhal Frio, which now still mops and vacuums, but you don't need to switch out the modules. It simply lifts up the mop on its own, gets to vacuuming, lowers the mop, and, well, mops. It's absolutely amazing, and now I can be even lazier. With their new and improved app, you can set it to vacuum, then mop, then vacuum 
vacuum again if you want to, for some reason, then it can clean its mops off and you really don't have to do anything except switch out the water tank. It's as easy as that and I've been using my narwhal since I got it, both the original one and this new one. This new one's great. And so I'm talking as someone who genuinely enjoys and uses the product. These are absolutely amazing. And so if you're interested, top link in the description. They're running a discount for Black Friday, which is right around the corner. It's up to $400 off if you buy it with its accessories, which is just an insane deal. And I believe 520 Canadian dollars. This is the first sponsor that hasn't left out Canadian dollars for me. Narwhal is a great brand. I really enjoy working with them. And it's a huge help to the channel, especially for longer videos like this that don't always make me a ton of money, but are fun to do. So hey, if you want to help out the channel and also take a look at a pretty cool vacuum cleaner, the top link in the description will bring you to the Narwhal Frio. Who knows, maybe this will be the perfect device for you. I know it is for me. My place has never been cleaner since getting it, and it's just kind of awesome. So big thanks to Narwhal for sponsoring the video. Let's get back into talking about the iPhone 5. Apple fans are salivating to get their hands on the newest iPhone. Apple Store will release the iPhone 5 for the first time. The iPhone 5's announcement caused huge waves of excitement across the internet and news media as Apple users looked lustfully at the all-new seamless and more gorgeous than ever fully aluminum design. Apple would begin taking pre-orders on the 14th of September, and within 24 hours, 2 million units were purchased. Apple even said the demand prior to the actual launch sold 20 times faster than previous iPhones, and it made for short supply come the official release September 21st. AT&T would state that it was the fastest selling iPhone they'd ever sold, far exceeding the supply available. And Apple stated they sold 5 million units over the opening weekend. That's three days for 5 million new iPhones. I really want to compare this to iPhone sales a decade later, but it's really hard to find concrete information on actual unit sale numbers, as Apple's not as open with that sort of thing like they used to be. According to Wikipedia, the iPhone 5 had a bit over 145 million units sold throughout its lifespan, versus 63 million iPhone 10 models sold. I compare these two phones, because like the iPhone 5, the iPhone 10 was only around for a single year, before being being replaced altogether by the iPhone XS and the XS Max. The iPhone 5 was there from late 2012 to late 2013 when it was replaced by the iPhone 5C, and after that, just like the iPhone 10, you couldn't purchase it even if you wanted to. While the smaller sale numbers of the 10 can be equated to a number of factors, such as lower supply and its high price tag of $1,000, and probably most prominently the competition from the iPhone 8 and 8 Plus, which came out at the same time, it still all does serve to show just how popular the iPhone 5 was, and selling almost 100 and 50 million units in a single year is absolutely absurd. For even more perspective here, the iPhone 4 sold 50 million units, the 4S 60. So the iPhone 5 sold more than both of them combined, and then some. And both those phones would be sold for longer than just a year. Right from the get-go, it's clear the iPhone 5 was extremely popular. But why? Why did this iPhone sell so much better than previous models? Why was there so much hype surrounding the launch? It comes down to a wide array of factors. But mainly, it was just different 10 years ago than it is today. Day. New iPhone launches were just special. Even if, like today, you had a pretty good idea of what could be coming before the phone was ever unveiled. Apple had been having a rough go at it when it came to keeping their projects secret, as iPhone leaks had become increasingly more common. The worst of which came the April of 2010 with an iPhone 4 prototype being torn down and published, all for the world to see by Gizmodo after a 27-year-old Apple software engineer had left the device at a bar. The iPhone 4 would be officially announced about a month and a half later when Jobs would open the unveiling with this iconic line. An all new design. Now, stop me if you've already seen this. <laughs> Believe me, you ain't seen it. You've got to see this thing in person. It is one of the most beautiful designs you've ever seen. The iPhone 4 would set a completely new standard for smartphones in every possible regard, but it went majorly backwards for keeping the iPhone secrets in-house. Apple would make a number of moves to both fight Gizmodo in court, as well as on their own end to try to clamp down on security and privacy, as the hype and unknowing of what was going to come next for iPhone was considered, and really is still considered, a major part of their branding. Apple has never been transparent, at least for their iOS devices, and this is a primary reason that even today, everybody in the tech or regular media space stops short regardless of being Apple users or not whenever an iPhone event comes around. It's a yearly moment that grabs the attention of those within the tech community, but also the mainstream as well. Something that most other companies have never been able to do. Companies like Samsung typically don't get the same level of attention, unless they're bringing a truly innovative or conceptual product like the Galaxy Fold, or they're having their smartphones explode, though they would probably rather people forget about that one. The iPhone 4S was 
known as the iPhone 5 when it came to rumors. And that's understandable when you consider how strange Apple's naming scheme seemingly was. There was iPhone, then iPhone 3G, iPhone 3GS, iPhone 4. Next would make sense for the fifth iPhone to be the iPhone 5, but that didn't happen. So technically the iPhone 5 is the sixth generation iPhone. And with the 4S, there had been a good few rumors pointing to a bigger screen, but that of course didn't come for another year. Early 2012 saw Tim Cook promising to double down on secrecy for unreleased products, but shockingly, this didn't really happen, with a number of drawings and leaks dropping long before the iPhone 5 would come out. A May 3rd report from iLounge would get things right on the money, calling for the taller screen, new dock connector, and a backplate that was partially metal. 9 to 5 Mac would post full pictures of the actual iPhone 5 casing, with both colors used. They said these units were being tested with micro SIM tech, which is the same SIM card size used in the iPhone 4 and 4S, which I find interesting, as the iPhone 5 ended up switching to nano SIM. So that's one of those little differences that tend to be found in prototypes. But what I found really funny was apparently there was a rumor calling for no SIM card. No nano SIM, no micro SIM, no nothing, no SIM card. And uh, yeah, a bit amusing considering that would finally come to iPhone 10 years later with the iPhone 14 Pro in the US being eSIM only. There were also rumors of an edge to edge display with a lot of mockups even looking kind of like an iPod Touch 4 with thinner bezels making the screen wider. Everyone remembers those classic 3D iPhone concepts trying to predict the future of iPhone and what they could look like in the coming years. When was the last time you saw a new one of those? It feels like it doesn't happen very often anymore because we are at the future. What we have now is kind of what we dreamed about 10 years ago, for better or for worse. I think it is fair to say that recent years have seen a significant decline in hype surrounding new iPhone launches, probably dropping off since the launch of the iPhone 10 when the current generation of phones have had their design set. Sure, the iPhone 14 Pro did finally move past the ordinary notch, but it's not near as exciting as removing something as vital to the experience as a home button is. People have become accustomed to very little change year over year, which makes sense as smartphones can only get so good and so compact before hitting some sort of threshold. While major strides are still being made on a regular basis, they're typically manifested in less obvious components, like in chipsets and camera sensors. But back before the iPhone 5 would launch, the truly early days of iPhones, this wasn't so much the case. It felt like every year was a huge new jump in smartphone tech, often because it actually was, with smartphones still being so new and the technology advancing exponentially. While an iPhone from three years ago today is still fairly comparable to the newest iPhone, this most certainly wasn't the case back around the early 2010s, and even changes unrelated to the design, like the addition of the first major voice assistant in Siri, was enough to cause chatter around the world. There was a lot of firsts always happening back in these days, and that's not the case anymore. My point is here that about 10 years ago, a new iPhone was an event to behold. It was almost like a holiday, like Christmas when you're a kid. Every year came this new icon of portable technology that would headline the advancements made within only 12 months. iPhones had generally been the peak of smartphones, and anything they brought would represent the best of what a mobile touch device could offer. But as talked about in the introduction, this was quickly beginning to no longer be the case, with companies like Samsung making a strong effort in pulling eyes away from Apple and to their own much larger phones, along with their huge array of more budget-oriented options that Apple was never going to bother competing with. Android was shifting away from their reputation of being for those who couldn't afford an iPhone to a genuine, even equally strong alternative. And this was putting major pressure on Apple to bring out the next big thing, as they couldn't ride on their own laurels forever. All that being said, this is an important context to set the stage for the launch of the iPhone 5 and the hype surrounding it. A small increase in display size seems like the most minor addition possible nowadays, but it was a groundbreaking event 10 years ago. And so it was that on September 12, 2012, the final iPhone to be built under Steve Jobs' direction would be officially unveiled. A phone should feel great in your hand, and more importantly, should be easy to use with this magical device we all carry called a horizontally opposed thumb. And that's just how we designed iPhone 5. It's a four inch display. You see with the vertical pixels now, we're able to add a fifth row of icons and all the software that comes on the iPhone 5 has been updated. Take advantage of this display. This truly is the world's most advanced display. And that's the first feature in the new iPhone 5. Encased in pure aluminum head to toe, still with the squared off edges, but now with no separation of the front and back panels, the only interruption on the iPhone 5 was the brilliant glass antenna bands on the top and bottom, which completely outdid any other smartphone, at least from an aesthetic perspective. Apple took something that had a tendency to be ugly, the antenna bands, and instead of hiding them, absolutely embraced them. The big reason that back in 2012, aluminum and all metal phones didn't tend to happen, and instead you saw a lot of plastic in the industry, was originally 
only due to the blocking of communications. You can't get a signal through metal, but you can through plastic or glass. Hence, say the big black plastic piece on the bottom of the first iPhone, which used aluminum elsewhere and a stainless steel frame. Somehow Apple had done it again, making the most impressive smartphone ever built to this point in a design not only just as beautiful, but more practical than the iPhone 4. While the iPhone 4 has a gorgeous build and is probably my own personal favorite iPhone, there's no denying the 16 by 9 aspect ratio is the most welcome and necessary addition with the iPhone 5, but there was also some major relief when it came to durability. As nice as the glass and stainless steel combination was, the fact is that glass is glass and glass breaks, something still very much true today, though we do have the benefit of a decade of innovation in making stronger and more resilient glass for smartphones. iPhone 4s and 4s's were notorious for spider webbed backs, and even a small drop could crack the device pretty easily. While the front glass on any smartphone could be cracked, it was really only iPhones that could say the same for the opposite side back in 2010-2011. The aluminum build naturally did away with this worry, and while the glass antenna bands could absolutely crack, it wasn't nearly as likely, and you could use the phone without a case with much more confidence. And if there was ever an iPhone you'd want to use without a case, this was it. This is one of the few smartphones that I think anyone, whether they be a fan of iPhone, Android, or even Windows Phone, would all agree this is one of the best designed phones ever made. The practicality aspect can be debated for sure, as the 4 inch screen is still pretty small, but when it comes to the overall package, well, there's a reason Apple would bring back this design with the iPhone SE in 2016, along with the general structure and even their newest flagships today. Yeah, it's no coincidence the iPhone 12, 13, and 14 lines all have flat, squared off edges. It's a direct callback to the iPhone 5, and taken with the frosted glass that gives that matte look found on the iPhone 14 Pro, what we have now really isn't that far removed from what we had 10 years ago, minus we don't have the glass bands on the top and bottom, and also uh, the camera bump is now like half the size of the iPhone 5 alone, but I digress. While this overall design has held up clearly extremely well, there are two areas that ended up being rough on the durability front, at least looking back over a decade later. The first is the home button. Obviously it's not Touch ID, which means you have to put in your passcode manually, but the fingerprint sensor would come the next year with the 5S. That would be a very welcome addition. But the issue here is that these home buttons do tend to sometimes get sticky after years of usage, possibly to the point of being completely unusable. I'm sure many of you remember that classic accessibility home button so many people had to use with older iOS devices, but in fairness in my experience, the iPhone 5 seems a bit more reliable than past models, though it's an issue that all these old iPhones do tend to suffer from. The other durability flaw was more unexpected and is still unique to the iPhone 5. The black and slate aluminum paint job turned out to be way too fragile for general usage. This would even be noted shortly after launch by some not-so-careful reviewers, as the coating was very prone to chipping. Researching this, I was even finding articles trying to promote the hashtag Scratchgate, but luckily that never took off. I think we have enough gates in our life, and this issue never seemed to be that detrimental in the grand scheme of things, just a visual annoyance. And in fairness, Apple would fix things the next year by just getting rid of the color altogether. And you saw that happen in other products that use the color, such as the iPad mini, the iPod Touch, and so on. The iPhone 5S would feature the same color in silver that the 5 was using, and naturally brought to that ever so popular gold. The first time an iPhone had a third color option, but it also updated the black to space gray. I have always liked the space gray in Apple products, though the actual gray shade seems to differ every year. But even so, for a long time there, the iPhone 5 was the last iOS device with a truly dark coating. There really wasn't one until the iPhone 7 with its matte black and its jet black especially, and only having that black in slate with its almost blue tinge for a single year really does make it feel more unique and even nostalgic in hindsight. And if you have one in nice condition that's been in a case its whole life, it's absolutely gorgeous. Combined with iOS 6 and hoo boy, it's hard not to fall in love with this phone all over again. There were a lot of minor design changes as well to the iPhone 5, a lot of which set the standard that is still used today. But there was one major addition to the iPhone design beyond just the enlarged display. One thing that a lot of people weren't a fan of, but would end up being a necessary part of every single iPhone for the next decade onwards. You know, the iPhone from its start has used the iPod 30 pin connector, which we launched originally in 2003. So a lot's changed and it's time for the connector to evolve. So now we have Thunderbolt, 
and Lightning. This connector is a modern connector for the next decade. All digital, eight signal design. It's more durable and much easier to use because now you can plug it in in either direction. It doesn't matter. It's 80% smaller. It's a huge difference in the world's thinnest smartphone. While the black and slate color was a source of minor controversy, the big new addition that stirred folks up was the all new Lightning port, switching from the 30 pin dock connector that Apple had been essentially using since the third generation iPod all the way back in 2003. The benefit of Lightning besides being smaller was that the charger was reversible and it could go in either way, meaning gone were the days of always failing to plug in your phone on the first try. Lightning was an amazing innovation and one that was pretty ahead of its time as Android still generally used the non-reversible micro USB. Well, eventually they would all start adopting USB-C, which is both reversible and provides faster transfer speeds than Lightning, Apple is still using the 2012 port today, though possibly not for much longer. Now, ideally I want to make this video to be timeless, something that can be viewed multiple years from now and still be enjoyable and accurate, but in short, while there are rumors alleging Apple will be moving to USB-C in 2023, the iPhone 14 Pro, released in late 2022, still uses the decade-old port. Impressive, it's managed to stick around so long, and like the 30-pin connector before it, it's become a staple of people's lives, with cords tending to be stuffed in drawers and plugged into outlets just about everywhere. But like when the move to USB-C inevitably does happen, there are those who won't be happy. In 2012, this was definitely the case as it meant people had to purchase new charging cords, though one of course came with the phone, as well as a wall adapter, which you don't get anymore. Really, I remember the big issue for my own family was the incompatibility with docking stations, which were extremely popular for iPhones and iPods in the early 2010s. They all featured 30 pin connectors, meaning you had to get an annoying adapter to actually still use it. Complaints aside, this wasn't like the removal of the headphone jack in 2016, as the switch to lightning absolutely had to be made, as that 30 pin connector took up a lot of space and wasn't nearly as practical. It might feel like the 2003 connector was definitely past its due date, and it was. But also don't forget, it was 9 years old in 2012, whereas the Lightning Board is 10 years old as of late 2022. Apple's been using it for longer than the 30-pin connector. Just wanted to say that to make us feel all prehistoric, kind of boggled my mind when I realized that. At this point, we're just so far removed from these old days of iPhones, even though it doesn't feel like it in many ways. And the iPhone 5 holds up quite well, all things considered. And when you look at the closest thing to it from 10 years prior, you end up with a second generation iPod. 2002, 2012, 2022. Safe to say, that leap in tech was absolutely massive. Whereas from 2012 to 2022, it's been more of a refinement. Screens have gotten bigger, the home button is gone, the bezels are as slim as ever, but iOS with its grid layout is still recognizable as iOS. Though iOS 6 sure does add to the nostalgia, and we'll be talking about it a bit later on, is the iPhone 5 was the final iPhone to run the old skeuomorphic aesthetic that Steve Jobs was so fond of iPhone 5. It is made entirely of glass and aluminum. It's designed and built unlike anything we or anyone in our industry has made before. It's just 7.6 millimeters thin. It's the world's thinnest smartphone. Lightning wasn't the sole shift in standards for the new age of iPhone. We also got Nano SIM, which are simply smaller SIM cards than previously used. And this came in conjunction with LTE, the new wave of faster cellular internet that would be quickly adopted by both carriers and new smartphones around this time. Other design changes included the headphone jack moving from the top of the phone to the bottom. This was actually kind of a big deal as it made the phone quite a bit more comfortable to use while plugged in, as the cord trailing from the bottom instead of the top is a bit less awkward. Plus, if you were charging it at the same time, you didn't have two cords from separate ends. And this was one of the benefits of having the 30 pin removed, you had a bit more space down there. This new location would be kept until the iPhone 7 removed the jack altogether. May it rest in peace. Apple also buffed up the microphones, adding for the first time a microphone to the back of the phone, which would help massively when it came to audio and video recordings. There was now officially three microphones with the iPhone 5, one on the back, one on the front, and then one at the bottom of the phone. This meant there a microphone ideal for every situation. Having the mic on the front for FaceTime calls seems like a pretty minor thing, but don't forget this is 2012. FaceTime had only really come out two years beforehand. Skype was still relevant, and video calling was a huge reason people wanted these newer smartphones. There was a lot of these little minor changes with the iPhone 5, and funnily enough I actually haven't spoken much on the biggest one. The first feature, described by Phil Schiller, that 4 inch retina display, and I'd be willing to wager that most of you hadn't even noticed I glossed over it. And there's a 
reason for that. The actual numbers and quality of the screen itself is fairly irrelevant to what people cared about when it came to this phone. All that really mattered was that it was now larger, and luckily it did have that classic Apple build quality backing it up. The display was pretty straightforward, a high pixel density LCD panel, specifically running a resolution of 1136 by 640, making for that magic retina number of 326 pixels per inch that we've seen on so many iPhones for well over a decade now. This was essentially the same quality introduced with the iPhone 4 in June 2010, at a time when no other smartphone even came close to it. And even in late 2012, the iPhone 5 had one of the crispiest, most beautiful displays on the market. Comparing it to the Galaxy S3, while the colors weren't as almost artificially vibrant as the Samsung was, thanks to its Super AMOLED panel, that phone and its 4.8 inches ran at 306 pixels per inch, making it a bit less crispy. It does go to show just how far ahead that iPhone 4 was in the display department. It was still not only compared but even better than most of the competition over two years after it came out, just at a smaller size. But unlike their competitors, Apple was content with sticking with their retina display for the foreseeable future, and it would only change with the plus model iPhones that would run 1080p and a pixel density of 401 pixels per inch, though the smaller models would stay at the same 326. The retina display on the iPhone 5 is gorgeous. Everything is clean, sharp, there's no noticeable blurriness or visible pixels. Even today, compared to the top of the line flagship iPhone, while that screen is going to be obviously better by a wide margin, I doubt that if you gave these two phones to a random Joe off the street, that they would actually really notice much of a difference besides the screen is larger now. And it's not as if the iPhone 5 had the exact same screen as the iPhone 4, as it did improve things in a few minor ways, something that Apple tended to do every year when it came to their retina screens. One big thing was in-cell touch sensor technology, which basically slimmed the screen and allowed for a thinner phone, which is why the iPhone iPhone 5 is significantly thinner than the iPhone 4 and 4S, and overall, it was a sleeker, slimmer, more complete package, and made for pretty much the ultimate iPhone at the time. For many, this is still considered the best iPhone design ever made, and very few iPhones since have come even close to capturing the same level of premium quality that this phone conveyed. It was a work of art. We began this video with a quote from Steve Jobs in the mid-90s prior to him rejoining Apple. Specifically, he was being interviewed as the CEO of Pixar soon after Toy Story. The interviewer was trying to egg him on a bit regarding Microsoft and his history with Apple, and they got to speaking on the internet. You've also mentioned Microsoft. Much of your current efforts seem to be directed at constraining Microsoft. Is that accurate? Me? On the, on no. The, you have, well, I, I, I've read some of these yeah. computer nerd publications lately, and it seems to me that the fight for the internet you envision is anybody but Bill Gates. Well, I think there's a lot of people working on stuff for the internet. We know from experience now that if any one company gets a dominant position in it, the rate of innovation is going to drop precipitously. What I found so fascinating was how John says that it was important for no one company to get a monopoly of things, as it would stifle innovation. The iPhone 5 sat at a crossroads between the Apple of old and the Apple of new, as Tim Cook had taken the helm, and Johnny Ive was given even more freedom to design devices as he pleased. This would result in a lot of good and a lot of bad, but it's hard to say they weren't ultimately successful, as Apple is currently one of the most valuable companies in the world and has been for the past decade. It's only grown since Jobs laid the foundation with his push for the iPhone and iPad, with the iPhone 5 being his final project. And I don't believe it's a coincidence that, as shown earlier, there's an insane difference from 2002 to 2012 in technological advancement, whereas the past decade has seen instead a rapid evolution and refinement of essentially the same thing year over year. The majority of tech used today had already been set in place by the time Steve Jobs passed away October 2011. While he wasn't the one engineering these products, it was his endless ambition and ability to bring his ideas to fruition that set him apart from others time and time again. What have we actually seen advance on the Apple side of things since the iPhone 5? I suppose the Apple Watch, but funnily enough that had already been kind of done with the 2010 6th generation iPod Nano that would have people, including myself, slapping them onto wristbands. AirPods from 2016 are one of the best products in my opinion that Apple's brought in the past decade, but even those still use the same design of earpods we actually saw come with the iPhone 5 for the first time. Even current iPhones call back to the same design that was established with the iPhone 5. It's as if, as far as we've moved forward, we're still rehashing the same thing that's existed 
lasted for a decade. And that's not necessarily a negative, but I do think it's worth pointing out. And I also think it's in part thanks to the fast rise of Android around 2012 that things continued to improve at a rapid rate in the technical performance. iPhone design may have peaked with the iPhone 5, of course that's an opinion, and certain adjustments like Touch ID were very much needed, but it was the internal hardware that had a lot of room for improvement. Apple Silicon at this juncture was still in its infancy, having come in 2010 with that A4 chipset in the iPhone 4, but it would only get better from there until eventually it's become a genuine contender with Intel and AMD, something I don't think anyone saw coming 10 years ago. And if Android hadn't been there to challenge Apple and steal away so many potential customers, a lot of this fast evolution may not have ever happened. Apple would be late to the party with the large displays not coming until 2014. But not only would that 2014 smartphone be the best-selling smartphone of all time, and by a wide margin, but they had continued to lead the industry everywhere else to that point, at least in a lot of different aspects, from their premium build quality to the hardware inside. One company with a monopoly discourages innovation, and that's why if you're a fan of the fruit company, you really shouldn't be too unhappy with the success of other competitors and or smartphones. Without the phablet seen in the Samsung Galaxy series, for example, you may have had to wait longer than to 2014 for larger display sizes, a feature a lot of people didn't necessarily realize would be so useful back then. Heck, I remember making fun of them. But with the quick takeover of media streaming and online consumption, all hosted on your potentially small smartphone, that bigger screen and bigger battery has become a necessity for many. The drastic fast improvements is part of the reason we've not seen a lot of relevant innovation in phones in the past few years. Sure, devices like the Galaxy Fold and Flip are cool and potentially the future, but realistically right now they're too expensive and impractical for the everyday user. Since the iPhone 5, we've seen a marathon race between manufacturers to see who could push the best hardware along with the best software. But this marathon has never had any clearly defined end goal, leaving phones in a pretty strange place a decade after the last Steve Jobs era iPhone. So what's next? A6 chip. Two times faster at CPU, two times faster at graphics. At LTE networking, we've updated every aspect of iPhone 5. Everything has been enhanced, re-engineered, redesigned over iPhone 4S. When it came to performance, the iPhone 5 was unsurprisingly a huge jump over the iPhone 4S, which itself had contained Apple's first dual-core chipset. The iPhone 5 featured Apple's A6 chip and 1GB of RAM, double the RAM of the 4S, which was absolutely necessary for the ever-increasing workload of software and for the longevity of the device. Storage capacities were the same as originally seen in the 4S, with 16, 32, or 64GB models. That 16GB would be a bit rough in the future, but then again, there does exist iPhone 6S models out there with 16 gigs running iOS 15, same goes for the first gen SE, so hey, it could always be worse. Geekbench would score the iPhone 5 2.5 times higher than the 4S, aligning with Apple's claims of two times the performance across the board on the previous generation. Something I really like from Apple's presentation is that they actually showed a lot of the practical use cases for the speed. Benchmarks are useful, but I've never been a huge fan as they don't give the whole picture. But in their keynote, Apple was showing things like faster app launch times, and 40 percent faster photo taking. This is something you don't see Apple do too much anymore because, while truthfully, modern chipsets are so fast and have been for so long that at least in a vacuum an iPhone 14 Pro probably won't feel much different from an iPhone 11 Pro for the majority of tasks. But back in these days, software would be advancing at such a rapid rate that the phones would really need these huge increases year over year to keep up and ensure usability for the standard five years and beyond that Apple would like to update their phones for. The 2013 iPhone 5S would take things to an entire new level, with the first 64-bit chipset in any smartphone, making the iPhone 5, as well as the 5C, the final 32-bit iPhones. You may remember that iOS 11 brought a major change when it came to old app support. Any app that hadn't been updated in recent years ended up being incompatible with the newer software, and this was because iOS had moved to 64-bit only. So 32-bit apps that had been left dead by their developers, such as Flappy Bird, which had been removed from the App Store completely years prior, these apps are impossible to play on any device running a version higher than iOS 10. Luckily, this iPhone 5 on iOS 6 it does indeed have Flappy Bird, so I can play one of the strangest and most simple games to ever go viral as much as I want, at least until the battery dies. The iPhone 5 battery has a charge capacity of 1440 milliamp hours, which is pretty small compared to modern sizes, though given the compact form factor of the phone, not unexpected. Luckily, iOS 6 is pretty lightweight. It was with updates that things would get worse, along with the greatest enemy of any piece of technology, 
time, not the spice, the clock time. Yet using any smartphone over time will result in battery degradation, and eventually you'll be at a point where using the phone can be nigh on impossible when you're not plugged in, especially when taken in conjunction with the more power-hungry iOS 10. But for its time, the iPhone 5 wasn't bad per se, and the battery life was neither really a high or low point for the phone in reviews. It's fine. Pretty typical of earlier iPhones, as it would take Apple a while, especially post iOS 7, to really nail down optimization. So having that full gig of RAM was a big help. Apple would have some pretty rough years when it came to the iPhone 4 ending its life on iOS 7 and the 4S getting to iOS 9. Both of these were just painfully slow, and the 4S especially is probably what I would consider to be the absolute worst iOS experience out there on an iPhone relative age taken into account. Mind you, the second iPhone, the 3G, was so slow on iOS 4, but I mean, that's a 2008 smartphone. It was the early days. The 4S doesn't have as many excuses. I would have much preferred the 4S getting one or two less versions of iOS and still feel fast than to get way too far and be practically unusable. If there were ever evidence of Apple putting planned obsolescence into action, the 4S is about as blatant as it gets. Thankfully, Apple turned things around at an impressively quick rate. The iPhone 5S got not only iOS 11, but also iOS 12. And heck, it would feel pretty decent on its final version, dare I even say somewhat smooth. They also showed they were no longer afraid to have a phone end its life a little early if it couldn't handle the next step in software. The iPhone 6 and 6 Plus are also stuck on iOS 12. And more recently, the first iPhone SE, 6S, and iPhone 7 all ended their run of support on iOS 15. The iPhone 5 is caught in the middle of the old and new Apple in terms of their user-friendly, long-lasting longevity. But that's not to say iOS 10 feels too bad, and thanks to getting that full five years of support, it would only be a few years back now that most major apps actually stopped supporting iOS 10. Meaning, even today, you can often use relatively recent versions of apps like YouTube and so on. The new hardware was integral for long software support, really making for some strong longevity in this phone. But we can't forget the other major new feature. The new addition of LTE networking worked wonders in keeping the iPhone 5 feel relevant as long as it did. Again, you can imagine the challenge the engineering team faced. Make the iPhone thinner, lighter, smaller, build in all the wireless technology you had with iPhone 4S and take it further. LTE is probably the most complicated networking technology ever brought to this earth. The iPhone 5 was the first iPhone to have 4G. Kind of. I have to say this because otherwise there will be comments. The GSM iPhone 4S had HSPA+, which AT&T would end up calling 4G, and so it would show a 4G batch in the status bar. It wasn't really 4G, it was like a faster 3G, at least according to the general standards. AT&T was just trying to sound cool. Either way, it definitely wasn't LTE, making the iPhone 5 the first LTE 4G iPhone. As for how much faster it was, this would vary depending on the carrier and a whole wide array of factors. But this chart that Apple would show at least gives a general idea of the improvement. It was a very much needed upgrade to the iPhone line as Androids had been adopting it quickly, and it also made for a pretty great marketing buzzword. Actually very similar to how everyone was using 5G a couple years back. And we do now live in the age of 5G, but truthfully most of us don't have access to connections much faster than LTE, with MM Wave 5G being the best and also slowly adopted by carriers. 4G is a speed still fast enough to work with without being annoying, and I'd honestly bet that most who've upgraded to 5G in the past few years haven't even noticed a difference beyond the little badge in the top right. I include myself there, I've been using 5G since the iPhone 12 now, and it's great and all, but LTE was working for me fine too. And if I go out of range for 5G, I get LTE, and it's fine. Of course, faster speeds are better, and if we can move on, we absolutely should, but it's still impressive that tech added a full decade ago is still being widely used today. And yes, LTE today on phones isn't the same as it was 10 years ago, right? things have improved, but even so. Heck, the first iPhone in 2007 had 2G, 2008 brought 3G, and the iPhone 5 in 2012, 4G. And then it would take eight years for us to get 5G in 2020. Just another example of smartphone evolution slowing down. Long story short though, LTE good, iPhone 5 had it, big jump in cellular internet speeds, very cool. Plus, whenever Apple adopts a newer technology like this, it forces carriers that are lazy to actually get with the times. So even if in 2012 your specific carrier had little limited 4G coverage after the iPhone 5 came out, it likely wouldn't take them too long to improve. And those are the essentials when it came to the performance side of the iPhone 5. Okay battery life, fast speeds with the A6 chipset, very fast speeds with LTE, and five full years of software support to boot. All in the sleekest, slimmest, and possibly most premium package we've ever seen of any smartphone. Next, 
the camera, an eight megapixel sensor, all the things you loved about the iPhone 4S, 25% smaller. And for the first time, a sapphire crystal lens cover. It helps protect your lens, make your images clearer and sharper. The ocean just looks bluer on the iPhone 5. Kids look happier. All right, Phil, you got me. That was a pretty good line. Got a good chuckle out of me. Watching through the 2012 iPhone 5 presentation, this may be the most low-key I've ever seen Apple talking about the camera system, at least to my memory. We're gonna be showing pretty much everything they say because they didn't say a lot. Why? Well, the iPhone 5 was truthfully just a slightly dolled up version of the iPhone 4S camera. Mind you, that's not a bad thing as the 4S had been a ridiculous jump for Apple's smartphone photography, bringing its eight megapixel Sony sensor on the rear that was capable of filming 1080p for the first time. The iPhone 5 carried that over and made some minor adjustments and improvements that I think we're all pretty used to seeing at this point. And Apple made it clear right off the bat they were aiming to take the 4S sensor and cram it into that oh-so-thin form factor, with apparently a 25% reduction in size for the whole setup. And yet another example of Apple showing off just how much work it must have been for them to make the iPhone 5 build even happen in the first place. There was so much planning that went into it, and this was the last design to not have a camera bump. That's something I really miss, having the fully flat back, especially compared to these ridiculous camera bumps we have nowadays. And don't get me wrong, I'm all for the repeated increases in thickness and weight we've been seeing in order to get the bigger, better cameras and longer battery life. However, I do sort of miss those days when Apple was able to blow everyone away by making such an impressive product in a design that in fact was the thinnest smartphone ever made. As we keep talking here, I'll put up some photos I've taken over the years. One big highlight with the camera was the sapphire crystal lens cover. This was a good addition for the sake of durability. Sapphire is strong, and they still use Sapphire today. So that's a subtle but very important addition. As I already said, Apple really didn't do a whole lot of hyping up for the camera, which is weird for them, but they did talk about their next generation ISP. More powerful hardware means you can do more with the software, and so photos could be taken faster, and among improvements, they were also claiming better low light performance. Now, that being said, is the low light performance actually good? No, it's it's not. It's an old phone. It's 10 years old, but they were getting better every year. And extreme example, pitch black out from my balcony, iPhone 5 versus my 14 Pro, no flash on, 14 Pro with the night mode, takes that long exposure. So extreme example of what 10 years of camera hardware and software can do. But as I said, they didn't talk a lot about the camera, and what I found really strange is they actually only showed off three photos. No really, that's all they showed off. They showed off the ocean here, the picture of the smiling kids, and then this fantastic photo of a bee on a flower. This is a really clear photo, some beautiful bokeh going on. I'm very curious what the setup was to uh, achieve this photo. I was actually gonna make a joke about how it'd be practically impossible for someone to get a photo this good of something that moves as much as a bee. But then I went outside, first time for everything, and I found a ladybug, and I was actually able to get some half-decent photos of it. I was not expecting that. And for comparison's sake, I did get a couple from my 14 Pro as well, which of course looks better. The most noticeable thing is the coloring. And the specific coloring here was actually a bit of a source of controversy when the iPhone 5 came out. It was noted that photos had a purple tinge to them, especially looking at a photo like this compared to my 14 Pro, and yeah, there is an absurd tinge to it. That being said, it turns out the iPhone 4S did this too, and so did a lot of smartphones around this time. Not every photo is this bad, but it is crazy to see that stark contrast in the warmth. As said, the phone isn't great with motion, so these photos of my younger brother from like four years ago now, which is crazy, a bit blurry, but still pretty cool to have. Overall though, I think the camera has actually held up quite well. Considering it's 10 years old and it's a smartphone, these photos are much better than what you would used to have before the 4S, and certainly good enough to store your memory and precious moments. And at the end of the day, that's pretty much the reason you take photos in the first place. But let's continue and see what exactly Apple was so excited to talk about next. The most amazing feature of the new camera is called Panorama. It's simply stunning the detail. Now we use this one because it's a tough one. So you can see the exposure changes from one end to the other as it goes from dark to light. The camera is amazing for taking pictures. Panoramas, that was a new feature, one I've hardly ever used, but it was here with the iPhone 5. I don't have a ton to say other than, did you notice that uh, purple tinge on the right side? of that first panorama there. Yeah, I'm never gonna unsee that in all these old photos now. And also, again, they only showed two examples here. I don't know why exactly they were so conservative with showing photos, but we all know what a panorama is at this point. It's nothing mind-blowing. Cool feature for the time, one I've always taken for granted, but let's keep going here. 1080p HD video. We've improved the video stabilization with the new ISP. We have face detection, and of course, you can take photos while you're recording video. 1080p video, of course, that came with the iPhone 4S, but taking some video for myself the other day, wow, 
Wow, 1080p, pretty solid. Amazing how long iPhones have been taking decent video for. This is a 10 year old phone, it's hard to believe. It might end up looking compressed on YouTube, that often happens. However, I can say right now, looking at it in its full quality, it's definitely not bad whatsoever. The FaceTime camera, 720p, great low light performance, there's face detection, and you can do FaceTime over cellular networks as well. So that's the new camera. EyeSight and FaceTime cameras built into iPhone 5. <laughs> So the FaceTime camera there, he's talking about the selfie camera. And just to recap here, I didn't really skip much. They didn't show any video examples. They showed no selfie examples. And the latter especially was weird because this was an upgraded selfie camera. It said 720p video. Well, it turns out it actually has 1.2 megapixels versus the iPhone 4S, which had 0.3. So while the selfie camera still sucks, <laughs> it was pretty good for 2012 and way better than the iPhone 4S. It's just really weird. It's like a completely different company here. Just skipping over all the camera stuff. Like it doesn't even matter and I, I know they didn't really improve much but the selfie camera any increase in anything nowadays is like celebrated as the best iPhone ever very stark contrast to see these kind of I guess early days post Steve Jobs a lot more reserved in maybe how they marketed themselves now in fairness this could be partly because this is where they talk about the new iPods as well same presentation and they did reserve quite a bit of time especially for that iPod touch so that's probably part of it but still three main photos two panoramas and no partridge and no pear tree even in the classic white background Johnny Ive voiceover little ad they have. Same picture that we already saw. Did they just not get good pictures? <laughs> Interesting to me all the same and overall here the iPhone 5 has a good camera and it has a good camera because the iPhone 4s has a good camera. That's what it really comes down to and that's totally fine. It holds up shockingly well 10 years later and you really can't ask for much more than that. Not just in the camera department but really anywhere when it comes to the overall experience. When you think about your iPhone it's probably the object that you use most in your life. It's, it's the product that you have with you all the time. We don't want to, to just make a new phone. We want to make a much better phone. By making the screen taller but not wider, you can see more of your content but still comfortably use it with one hand. And yet, even with the larger display, iPhone 5 is the thinnest, lightest iPhone we've ever built. The iPhone 5 was one hell of a phone, and it provided a consistent, reliable, and premium experience for its users from the fall of 2012 to the release of iOS 11 in the fall of 2017. Five years of updates was very impressive, but the iPhone 4S had already accomplished it first. However, this time, the final version of software didn't move like molasses sliding uphill. From the ever so nostalgic skeuomorphism of iOS 6 to the flat practicality of iOS 10, the iPhone 5 will always be one of the greatest smartphones ever made without any doubt. Originally here, I had an entire chapter written regarding the experience of iPhone 5 in special regard to its early iOS 6 days with both the good and the disastrous. We look back at the uh, software with rose tinted glasses now, but when it first launched there was a good few issues, almost all of them concerning Apple Maps, which was just awful. And even to today, it's never fully quite recovered from the negative reputation it garnered so early on. I also had a section on jailbreaking, by the way, I didn't forget about it. The jailbreaking scene at this point was huge in the early days of iPhone, but this video has dragged on so much longer than I expected. Heck, I originally planned to keep it down to like 20 minutes, and well, that didn't happen. As I got to writing and putting the video together, it was just thing after thing I felt like I needed to talk about. Going through the Apple keynote and just seeing everything they were so hyped about at the time. One decade later, the iPhone 5 stands as still perhaps the most refined smartphone ever to release. That design is still being replicated 10 years later, after a long era of Apple trying other options but never capturing the same level of pre premium quality they once had, until, at least for me, their recent run of iPhones. I did love the iPhone 10 with its stainless steel and glass backing, but the move from the rounded to the flat stainless steel that seamlessly blends with the matte frosted glass on the back not only reminds me so much of the iPhone 5, but it feels to me like what is the ultimate iPhone design, taking the best elements of what they've created and merging it all into a polished premium package. The iPhone 5 wasn't so much ahead of its time, or even revolutionary, its legacy lives on, sure, but not because the phone was groundbreaking, but because it was, is, and always will be timeless. The iPhone 5 hasn't aged well, it just hasn't aged. This iPhone is a timeless smartphone design, and one that will never truly go away for as long as we keep getting new slabs of glass to fit in our pockets year after year. To borrow the words of Tim Cook, surely this was the biggest thing to happen to iPhone since iPhone.
Well, this was quite the project and I really hope you enjoyed. Love doing these long form videos, mostly. They're a lot of work, but they're fun. And I wanted to give the iPhone 5 a proper celebratory send off for its 10 year anniversary. I did the same for the 4S last year and the 4 the year before. And I may or may not be planning something for the iPod Touch 5, which came out at the same time as the iPhone 5. And maybe we'll see a 5S retrospective in 2023, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. That is, unless Apple Maps is guiding us, in which case we'll probably end up in the middle of the ocean. If you're still craving more iPhone 5 content, I did recently purchase and unbox a brand new one in silver, still running iOS 6.0. I'll link that in the description. We didn't see much of that phone in this video as I still haven't even taken the plastic off, so it's not exactly ideal for B-roll, but a lot of this video has been in the works since long before I got that phone anyways. And I wouldn't have been able to do this sort of long video, invest all this time in it, if it weren't for today's sponsor, Narwhal. Big thanks to them for making this video possible. Top link in the description, you can get yourself the best robot vacuum cleaner on the market. I do unironically use it all the time, by the way. It's not a joke, the uh, Frio is amazing. So again, thanks to them for sponsoring the video. And hey, if you enjoyed the video and made it this far somehow, please hit the like button. I would appreciate that. Maybe subscribe if you haven't already. I mean, you did watch me for an hour. And if you'd like even more of me, you can follow me over on my social medias, TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, at 91 underscore tech. And hey, maybe even chat with me on the Discord. That'd be cool. Hope to see you there. Thank you so much for watching. It means a lot. I'm Josh from 91 Tech, and I will see you all next time.